everybody. Well, it's finally here. Third World Congress. Woo! 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 This has been uh, two and a half years in the planning, and uh, of course, I'm going to start off with the obligatory selfie with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, on the count of three, I want a big wave, okay? So, one, two, three, big wave! Woo! <laughs> okay. I'm going to press the word of the tweet. That is now on the IACL Twitter feed. You can follow IACL on Twitter at IACL. It should be there. Or if you search for that hashtag, <coughs> IACL, hashtag IACL WC3, you should find it. Um, it's been my great pleasure over this past two, two and a half years, in fact, to work with colleagues across IACL to put together the program uh, that you see in, in the um, um, We'll talk about uh, technical setup and this. I, I, I should report, actually, we've already had a, a big technical problem this morning in, in the room, sad. Pat Caroline, I believe, did not realize that the orange juice is, is, not, uh, is not diluted. It's concentrated orange juice. Man. Yeah, so... Uh, so if you're using the orange juice, it doesn't mean you do need to add water to the orange juice. So uh, uh, I'm hoping that's the only technical problem we face today, but we're, we're trying a lot of stuff. So uh, let's see how we get on. Um, oh, now, we're just going to get the honest. The presentation this morning, the number of presentations through the week, are uh, you know, require quite a lot of detail on the screen. We're hiding this beautiful high-density projector. It doesn't mean I'm going to dip the lights, so for so I think about there. That's okay. You will target adapt over minutes. A lot of you know about dark adaptation, so it looks dark in the moment, but you fly in a few minutes. Um, it's um, uh, my pleasure to welcome you to uh, to Manchester, uh, uh, where certainly where I'm based. I work at the University of Manchester in the uh, optometry department there, and uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the city now. A lot of people, just about everybody, the first thing they said to me as they've arrived over the last couple of days is, oh, it's a bit cloudy, it's a bit cool, you know, weather. Don't forget, here's Manchester here. Manchester is on about the same, about the same latitude as Moscow, pretty much, right? So, uh, in fact, the northern wastelands of Canada. So, uh, this is why it's pretty cool here, but it looks like the weather forecast is going to be reasonable for the next few days. Just to orient anywhere around the United Kingdom, here's the United Kingdom. I'm conscious most of our delegates are not from the UK, only about 10% are from the UK, so you know, just bear with me whilst I explain. Here we are, here up in the northern regions of England here, this is sort of the border between England and Scotland here, so in the north. And for those of you who are travelling the BCLA, the BCLA, where we're going on Thursday, is here in Liverpool, here we are. Uh, about 30 miles due west here in, on the southern part of Manchester city centre. I'm also welcoming you today to the University of Manchester, where, but this in, this uh, conference centre is zoned and operated by the university. We're just on the southern edge of the, the, the university campus here in Manchester. We'll be moving into the more central regions where we go for our gala dinner on, on, on Wednesday night. But uh, it was my academic hat on as a university faculty member. Welcome to the university. This is the largest university in the United Kingdom. We have 40,000 uh, undergraduate students. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Well, this is the third IACA World Congress on Contact Lens Education. The first one. Who was at the first one? Raise your hand if you were at the first one. Quite a few old people in the room. Hello, old people. <laughs> who was at the second one? Not the same sort of people, and you're all the third one, so you like that. You don't need a race now. Uh, the first two meetings were in the University of Waterloo in 1994 and 2002. And it's, here we are today. Bit of a verbose title. Um, uh, we're going to abbreviate this throughout the week WC3, okay? This is the abbreviation. But the reason I'm standing here, I want to take you back to WC1, the first meeting. The first meeting was in June. 1994. It actually happened about one week after this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> My beautiful wife and bride, 
My current wife is with us here in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, darling. Uh, and so, actually, the first meeting, the first World Congress, had a big part in our life because we were arranging all the, uh, you know, the wedding stuff. What do you call that? Wedding. Did you say we? We. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My wife was arranging all the wedding uh, arrangements. And she had planned, you know, a lavish you know, three, five, eight-week honeymoon, you know, something like that after the wedding. And uh, so six or eight months beforehand, I had to say, so, uh, actually, darling, there's a there's quite a, a good meeting I need to go to one week after after the wedding, so we're going to have to curtail our honeymoon plans <laughs> and, and not perhaps go to uh, Venice or, or, or Beijing or, uh, or Rio de Janeiro. We had a week just south of Birmingham, actually, uh, in, in England. And um, uh, one week after our wedding, I left my new bride and uh, went to what I think is the best meeting I've ever been to, the First World Congress. In 1994, one of the early meetings in my career, of course, this is 21 years ago, but it's uh, I think unsurpassed in, in, in what we learned. And I'm hoping that we can replicate some of the, the learnings of that sort of meeting uh, here this week. That's very much my aim. Uh, here, are, you know, here's what people look like at that meeting. I only have these two photos from the meeting. This is uh, this is Nathan Efron. Um, this is his wife. His very young-looking wife at the time. Who uh, this was at the Gala Dinner, which had a sort of a futuristic thing, which is why Nathan had, I think, got a lot of Tuppen pen in his head. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, these were the crazy times in, in the 90s. And, and I think the reason that I was keen to get, get heavily involved in this meeting together was, was because of the stuff I learned 21 years ago. I, I can remember now, at that meeting, we were shown um, video conferencing. Now this was at a time before Internet Explorer. It was the very beginnings of the World Wide Web. We, 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 we used a browser at the time. I don't know if anybody who was there might remember. So we called NCSA Mosaic, which I think was the first widely used web browser. It was shown this, and it was like it really was a glimpse into the future. You can imagine what things were like then. And I'm hoping some of the things we'll do this week will be a glimpse in the future. Stuff we learned stuff then. It almost seemed so improbable that we thought this would never come to pass, and, and, uh, and of course it did. And I'm hoping we can replicate some of that. What's the behind you? Okay, so yeah, you want to see here? This is this is me. Nice. I don't mind having that tie. It's my favourite tie. Uh, this is Craig Woods. Is that you? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is our now present. She's at. It's kind of, that's when you would admit that, that was your big quip sort of period. <laughs> and, uh, and over here, Nathan, Suzanne's wife, and then Sarah, my uh, my first wife. Uh, <laughs> of course, this was just along the corridor. We were in almost neighboring offices, so it wasn't such a big breakthrough in terms of video conferencing. But, uh, but, but, it, but it, we, could, we could hear each other through the walls. Actually, I am hoping, I am hoping for uh, some good interaction for other meetings, so thank you Suzanne for your continual interruption during my <laughs> um, But of course we learned a little bit about video conferencing. Here we are today uh, broadcasting this event live to the world. I mean, so the stuff that we learned 20 years ago did come to pass and it's now in mainstream we can all video conference from our phones, from our homes all the time. So. Um, I'll come on to our video, our, um, our broadcast in a moment. Okay, so I, I want to just spend a few minutes just orientating everybody to what's happening uh, through the week. Uh, everybody should have this program uh, in, in your uh, delegate packs. I've got some, uh, I want to make sure that I'm covering everything. I was going to write down my housekeeping notes on paper last night in the bar where we was. Perhaps not appropriate, uh, so I've written it down on my on my phone. Uh, but of course, there is that awkward overlap between technology and presbyopia that sort of uh, <laughs> uh, hits. But, um, actually, if anybody's got a good solution for presbyopia, this is something we really need to think about and try. And, uh, this is a problem. Okay, we are broadcasting to the world. Hopefully, a number of our colleagues around the world are currently watching me. Um, and seeing our slides, so hello everybody who's watching around the world. 
Uh, just to note then that this is a live broadcast. If during the tea break you find yourself standing around this area, perhaps with a colleague, just on your own, you want to you know, share a few secret words. <laughs> just be a little bit cautious about speaking near this microphone because you are being broadcast a life of the world. It is important to, to say that you could come unstuck. Um, let's talk about the room. There are uh, power sockets uh, uh, around the room, probably about there's probably about one power socket for every three people, so hopefully uh, that's going to be sufficient. Um, and most people I know are coming with more tablet based devices than laptops. Um, but please just think about your powering, think about your charging, make sure you get a good charge uh, overnight for, for your, your, your devices. Um, and do watch out, the, the cables are reasonably well uh, tacked to the floor, but do watch as you come in and out of the room as you, as you move around. Um, let's talk about uh, today. Today's program, I think, fairly self explanatory. Um, Craig is talking after me, and then Pat and uh, Shazam and Fabrizio. Uh, later on. You'll see for each of the lunch times we have our uh, sponsor symposia uh, through the through the lunch times. Um, this means that we will be eating lunch. We have about 45 minutes for lunch in the, uh, the dining room and then we'll be coming back here uh, at about, um, about quarter past one for the remaining 45 minutes of that sort of middle period. Uh, I think we'll be we'll have coffee served outside so coffee will be served outside as we'll bring in here for each of our three Sponsor symposium. Uh, today in the afternoon coffee break, we are um, <laughs> going to have a photograph. A number of people asked, could they be notified early if we we're going to have a photograph? Well, you've got uh, about eight hours notice that we're having a <laughs> photograph at 3 30 this afternoon during the tea break. Uh, dinner tonight uh, is at 6 30, just to confirm the dinner time tonight. Um, again, we'll be having dinner and then coming back in here. Uh, about 7.30 with coffees when we're going to have a fantastic presentation by David Thompson who has a this, uh, something called the Gadget Show where he's going to be looking at what we're going to be using in optometric practice for our instrumentation in about 50 years time, I think. So that will be uh, fantastic. Just to confirm actually that all of the end sessions finish at 5.30, 17.30 all the sessions finish in the evening, just to confirm that. Um, tomorrow uh, we've got a, a fantastic um, session in the afternoon, a uh, business, more business orientated session that's actually uh, Sarah, my wife Sarah is, uh, is chairing with our, our colleagues from industry, so that'll be uh, a great session. Tomorrow evening, um, dinner is really at your own, uh, with your own arrangement, so I think a lot of people will be going out for dinner somewhere in Manchester probably. Uh, you can eat here on, on site at Chancellor's. If you have any questions about dinner tomorrow evening, then Bonnie can mm -hmm. take those. Has everybody met you, Bonnie? Do you want to stand up, Bonnie, just so everybody recognizes you? Here's Bonnie. Well <laughs> okay, Wednesday evening is our uh, gala dinner. The gala dinner is in the Manchester Museum. That's about three miles north of here. We're going to get there by coach. Please gather if you're staying here, please gather at 6.45 on Wednesday evening. The coach will leave at 7 o'clock prompt. The coach has to be on time. If you do miss the coach, then you, you presumably can arrange a taxi or something like that. But just it's much easier if you just here on time. 7 o'clock here, if you're at the Best Western, we'll be with you. Uh, I don't know, it's uh, two minutes past 7, something like that. Uh, and then we'll be coming back at 10.30. Finally, for these housekeeping arrangements, Thursday, uh, we've got our AGM. AGM is part of breakfast at 8.30. Please remember to check out and through the morning period. Uh, we'll need to return your iPad if you have a if you borrow an iPad. Just to say that if you were given an iPad at registration, it is a short term loan. Okay. <laughs> we have marvelous industry sponsors. Um, but um, we uh, the iPad is just on loan, not not as some sort of a lavish gift. Yeah. We will yes. Confirm breakfast first, then AGM. Breakfast first, then AGM. We'll talk about this as we get nearer the time. Uh, when uh, Thursday seems to be along the way uh, from now. Uh, and then finally, uh, after check out, the coaches will leave to the BCLA for those of you going at 2 p.m. We have two coaches, one which is going direct to Liverpool, the second which is stopping off at the Trafford Centre for about a two hour period before continuing on 
to Liverpool. The traffic centre is a large out of town shopping and entertainment mile. So if you haven't had time to do shopping, uh, then you will have that opportunity. Now, we need to know which coach you want to be on, Bonnie. Yeah. And people will really come and talk to you, is that right? <laughs> so we need to know before the, uh, we need to know before the end of tomorrow which coach you're going to be on. The one that's going direct or the one that is going to stop off at the traffic centre. Okay, that's enough, I think, of housekeeping arrangements. <coughs> Um, I wanted to try something a little bit new for this meeting. Um, this website, wc3shownotes.com, is going to be your go-to resource for a lot of the information to cover that the event. Okay, uh, Alison and Siobhan here on the front row are updating this live as we speak, uh, and so this is going to be a, a continual record principally of the sort of links and resources that are discussed through the week. So you can look this up now or at a later time, wcshownotes.com. Uh, by the time we get to the end of the meeting, it'll be a fantastic uh, resource of, uh, of information for the meeting. I should say that everything also is being recorded too, as well as being live broadcast and will be available after the event. Uh, this is our Facebook page. Oh, yes, I want to encourage everybody to take photographs and have thoughts through the meeting. Then please uh, go to our Facebook page and update it there. Uh, and that's a long, tedious address. But if you're at wc3shownotes.com, that website is a clickable link um, from that page. So you don't have to copy that down. You do need to know, know wc3shownotes.com. And here's the official article. Uh, Hashtag or official hashtag for me. My last thought before I pass on the, some opening words from our, our colleagues in industry is that I'm doing this as like a 50 50 event. What I mean by that, and this reflects my experience from previous meetings, is I reckon half of the information and good stuff that you'll learn from this meeting is what you'll hear. In this room, people like me talking about things, about half of it's that. But the other half really is what you'll gain from meeting uh, all of our colleagues from around the world and what happens in the tea breaks and the bar in the evening uh, and over dinner and lunch. So, um, you know, we can bring everybody together like this about once a decade. So let's, you know, make good use of the opportunity to talk with colleagues from around the world, hear best practice, uh, as well as what happens. Uh, in the room here. We are represented by all three IACL regions, and I just want a bit of a cheer for all the three regions. Uh, the first region is our Asia Pacific region. Hello. Uh, the Americas also, that's uh, North and South America. And the final region is our Europe. Africa and Middle East region. Hello. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, just a word on networks before I pass to our sponsors. There are various wireless networks available. We have, uh, we've gone for belts, braces, spare belts, an extra pair of braces uh, approach. I should say for Americans in the audience, braces are suspenders, I believe. <laughs> Conjures up all sorts of imagery for me, but um, uh, I think sort of order that the ones that uh, you have to, to use. If you have an edge your own account, you should find that that works here as well. Edge your own, if you don't know, is a, a, a mainly a university-based worldwide wireless access system. So if you have an account with one university that is on the edge your own system, then uh, it should work anywhere in the world. If it doesn't, you need to go back to your institutional web pages and, and ask there. There's nothing that can be done here at this institution because it's, it's an issue. It'll relate to your credentials at your home institution rather than something here. Uh, next up, there is the UON Wi Fi network. Um, that's the one where if you use the username and, and uh, password on the badge that you have, um, that should work for there. This hotel also has a third wireless network called the Cloud. That's another option, but probably is the third option. And we also have a, a sort of a, a private wireless network that we're running some of the audio visual from. Okay, I want to um, I, uh, now just talk briefly about our, our sponsors. Um, 
You get all sorts of meetings and somebody will say, this couldn't have happened without sponsors. This meeting could not have happened without a sponsor's contribution. Um, to get everybody uh, from all over the world in a, in a room like this, we need huge amounts uh, of support uh, and generous funding from our sponsor companies. And we've been very fortunate to do that, to have received that support for our meeting from our, our three sponsors. And not only that, we, we hope and we believe at IAPL that our industry colleagues are genuine partners in driving the needs and goals of the association. We meet and talk regularly with our colleagues from industry uh, outside of this particular event, but also as part of this World Congress. So we're, we are very grateful um, to our sponsors, and you know, um, this needs to be recognized through the week. We've got some senior colleagues from, uh, from the three companies, um, and I just would like to invite you just to say a few words of, of welcome and introduction, probably starting with, with Dwight. Can you can you say a few words for us, Dwight? Sure. Let me perhaps just give you the microphone. I will say for our people watching online, it is going to be helpful if you've got a lot to say to use uh, the microphone. So uh, as and when the opportunity arises, please uh, consider using the microphone. So Dwight. Thank you, Phil. Um, I just had one clarifying question. What exactly did you mean by senior? Uh, 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 well respected, oh, okay. uh, old. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> well, on behalf of all of my colleagues at Alcon, I'd like to also welcome you to the third World Congress for IACL. Um, Phil and Shazad and the entire IACL leadership team has spent so many hours over the past two and a half years organizing this meeting. And as Phil mentioned, um, the industry representatives have met regularly with the IACL leadership team and provided input and provided our thoughts since we're involved in many meetings around the world. And I'm just so pleased with, with the, the outcome of the agenda and, and the quality of the speakers here. So I can tell you on, on behalf of Alcon, we are extremely pleased to be a supporter of this meeting and to be personally here interacting with you and, and sharing our thoughts with you over the next three and a half days. So welcome and have a wonderful meeting. Yes, uh, Gary Oswald here from, from uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, just to echo Dwight's words, uh, it, it is a, very much a privilege to have been involved um, with the organizers and, and the support that we could give uh, to everything that is going into this meeting. Um, you are the biggest influencers on uh, the, the future of our profession. And whatever we can do to support you, not only at, at this meeting, but also into the future, is extremely important to us. So on behalf of Cooper Vision, my colleagues who are here, uh, and on, on behalf of uh, even e everyone at, at Cooper Vision, uh, wishing you success for this meeting and looking forward to all the interaction we'll have over these days. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ian Davis from Johnson & Johnson Vision Tech. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to one of the nicest days that Manchester has had in uh, this time of year in many years. <laughs> but uh, I just want to say that after JJ, huge congratulations to Phil, Zach, and the whole team putting together an event like this. The amount of work involved is huge. Anyone who's ever tried to pull together a small event will know that. To bring this number of people from so many different parts of the world is tremendous. We're honored to be being asked and being able to be part of this. This really is one of the core values of everything that Johnson Johnson holds true to. And we're really looking forward to working with you over the next few days to a very successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we'll move on to my, my presentation. Smart tools for efficient working. I think that um, in the 20 years since we had our first meeting, I think the, the way that we have to work as, as, as academics and educators, I think has changed dramatically. 
I, I remember talking with people at that time, you know, from groups who perhaps have been educators in the 70s and 80s, and how it, this apparently rather leisurely existence that they had, and so much time, and importantly, so much support that they had uh, around the world, particularly administrative support, secretaries, for that sort of thing. And that, of course, is long gone. We, we have to operate essentially now as, as individuals, we have to essentially operate our own office. Uh, ourselves, don't we, and, and, and do a lot of that sort of work. So I'm hoping today to talk about a lot of the workflows and way that, that I work in, in, in my office, and uh, I've tried to sort of be innovative in how I go about this, and I'm, I'm going to share, share that with you today, in the hope that this might, some of this will stick, some of this you'll find would, perhaps will benefit you, and maybe, maybe improve your efficiency and the workflow because there are a huge amount of tools made by uh, leveraging the internet, the cloud and these sorts of technologies that I think you know, give us a new ways of working. I, I can't say it's the perfect way to operate. These are a number of skills and tools that I've learned over a long time. Hopefully some will resonate uh, with you and there will be good, good stuff you can take away. What, uh, what you need for this session is really, uh, you want to get, and if you don't wish to get interactive, you don't need to do so, but if you would like to get involved with this session in a more interactive way, then you need two things. You need the Evernote uh, app if you're on a tablet device, or you can just go to the Evernote website if you're on a laptop. And then some form of web browser, so that could be uh, Safari if you're on an iPad, or, or another web browser on a different tablet, or, uh, or a, a, a browser on your laptop. Uh, I should say, I had a question first thing this morning about, oh, is this, all, is this all about the iPad? Everything we do this week, I think, just about everything we do, is generic or agnostic in terms of the operating system that you use. So uh, um, if you have an iPad, things should work. If you have a, an Android-based tablet, things should work as well, or indeed a laptop on whatever operating system you have. So we are agnostic in that sense. So the major thing, of course, that has changed in our work um, environment, I think, over the past few years is speed of the internet and also the <coughs> growing availability of cloud-based uh, technologies. So you've all heard of this term, the cloud-based technology, and uh, I think a lot of you will know about this. But what is this? Well, it's essentially a system where, across the various devices that we might have, then each of these talks to uh, a server that is philosophically, at least, in the cloud. It's out there somewhere. We don't necessarily know where it is. But it means if I write something on, let's say, my laptop, then I can continually talk to a server up in the, up in the crowd. That was a very nice little, that, that little tinkle there that came in was perfect for that, that um, data being transmitted around the world. So uh, the cloud means that something that's written on one device <coughs> is automatically passed on to whatever other devices you have configured to work with your cloud account. And also that information is also stored in the cloud itself. So of course, at a later time, you might get your iPad in, you might, uh, you might um, edit that text, and then of course everything is synchronized to all your other devices. Pretty simple maybe, but this philosophically is very, very important because it's not just about writing text, there's all sorts of uh, things we can do. It also means that if we, uh, if we are out somewhere less familiar, we are just getting a coffee or out at a conference, or in a restaurant, then also we can uh, get our device and have the information immediately transferred to it. Now, it's not just about a text. You can uh, have uh, uh, any sort of file format, attractive photographs, uh, such as this one. Um, files, of course. But having set up the infrastructure, having the cloud, the synchronizing infrastructure, then how we can uh, send information around that and differ, and we have now a number of fantastic resources that are available. And of course, we can make these resources, this information, these photographs, text, or whatever else we're doing, available potentially 
to a huge number of, uh, of colleagues that we might be working with, that they can also get this information. So without really us having to do anything, without us really having to think about it, we can write something on our own laptop, and this is instantly available and visible to anybody who we authorize to be able to see. And there are, of course, many different resources which effectively take advantage of this approach. And I think we're just at the beginning of this. I think the, the, this notion of cloud computing and everything being available to us everywhere is going to transform um, um, our lives over the next 10 to 20 years. And a lot of the technologies that we'll learn about this week essentially rely on this sort of format. Something that I've been using that's really transformed the way I've worked is developing a paperless workflow in my office. Trying to get rid of making notes on paper, trying to get rid of filing stuff all the time, and to bring it all together in a, uh, a central electronic storage system. The program I use is called Evernote. Now there are uh, two or three other technologies or, or approaches which you can adopt. I'm sure they're great. I, I only really have extensive experience with this one. I've been using this since, I think, 2009, when it first came out. Now, um, I'm going to be doing some demonstrations with this at the moment. According to our pre-meeting survey, 14% of uh, our delegates have an account, at least, with this system. So most people don't. So um, um, hopefully, this will be uh, helpful to you. And even though it's in 14%, maybe, uh, the stuff I'm doing that might also be useful. Now, this is where I need to switch to my laptop. We'll see how this works. So, uh, what, is, what is Evernote? Why, why, why might this be useful to you? Well, Evernote, we can think of as an everything bucket. Everything that you do can end up in this one file system, and once it's in there, it is immediately available to all your devices. The information that you can put into this bucket is very variable. It can be write text. But you can put in any sort of file that you want. You can take photos, video, anything can end up in that bucket. And once it's in the bucket, it's available to you on whatever device that you use. And I find this to be an extraordinarily useful way of, of, of working. Not only that, but you can authorize elements of the bucket, parts of the bucket, to other people. And that can be one other person or indeed large groups. People. So there might be areas of your work where it's useful uh, to make some of the resources that you're putting in this bucket uh, available. So uh, in its very simplest form, and it's easy for sitting down, I need to type now and everything should be happening uh, above me. In its very simple form, it's a, it's a simple text editor. So you know, we might uh, open the window here and uh, you know, let's put down um, things to remember for uh, WC3. Oops, W3 pants on. <laughs> yeah, so you know, what might you need to have your trousers, uh, your laptop, a phone charger, and all the rest. <coughs> okay, so that is, um, there you go, there's things to remember for the WC3. Uh, now, that also now should be available to me on my phone, for example. So this is now available to everything uh, on my resources. So I'm going to just hopefully now. Oh. Uh, so here's my phone. Okay, here's my phone. This is what's on my phone at the moment, and. Uh, well, you can see uh, things to remember for WC3, trousers, laptop, and phone drive. There is no way with this sort of technology I can figure out my trousers <laughs> or my phone charger or indeed uh, my, my laptop. 
So uh, if you've not used this sort of system, that if you think about it, once you give that some thought today, it starts to blow your mind because all of your stuff is available to you at all times. Not just trivial lists of things and conferences, but information about major projects. The reason I find this very, very useful is that I have my phone with me all of the time. I happen to be my train to do my work. So as I'm thinking through and working through projects, I can be adding to this information on my phone, and by the time I get to the office, it's all there on my desktop. So just perhaps thinking about the um, um, the potential for this sort of thing. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, this can also be shared. You ready, Sarah? I'm ready. Uh, shopping list at the bottom there. This we, we this is not a this thing is not particularly this is not staged. My wife and I have a shared shopping list, and whenever we think about what something we might need, we go to our shared shopping list and uh, add whatever items so that whoever's next at the store at the shop uh, can do it. So can you change the shopping list then? What have we got in a minute? Well, what did we have? We had. Nutella, Marmite, and eggs. Sarah's editing that, that's it. Have you added something else to the diamond? Okay. Let me just say that. It'll, it'll sink and uh, we might have to go in in a second. Recently added a refresh note. <clears throat> okay, well, that's. Whilst my wife is there, we go. Okay, so we've got the toilet rolls and suspended now. <laughs> okay, so once again, it's a sort of a trivial, trivial example. It's a trivial example, but again, just think about how that might influence the way you work with a colleague, somebody you might be writing a paper with overseas, somebody you'll be working on a new course with in your own department. It's extremely powerful. Um, how else can we how else can we use this? So I need a full text. Just want to show a couple of again real world examples of the way that I I, I use this. I have uh, essentially a, uh, a sort of a dashboard of information. You must have something similar, sort of bits of information that you need to return regularly all the time and you're never quite sure where to put this might be a list of phone numbers a list of resources uh, account numbers uh, and, and all the rest of it so this is uh something i have a list of phone numbers of colleagues so you can have to look it up but you can also bring in if there's files that you need to look at regularly here are some things that uh, that i have in mind sort of a list of uh, staff colleagues which we <laughs> bring up there. This is how, our, uh, how the education team works in, in our faculty. So I've got all of this information immediately at hand. Not just on my desktop at work, but also on my phone and on my iPad 100% of the time. I find this system incredibly powerful, maybe best of all when you're attending a conference. The whole work up to a conference that Perhaps you've been asked to do a, a, a talk or coordinate part of the meeting, and then all of the information you collect through the meeting. So here's a sort of a, an edited version of, um, of my VCLA notes from, from last year, going from everything from uh, the program uh, the event, which we've got open up full screen. Perhaps I wouldn't do that just now, but here's the program. And then I collected, as the meeting has gone on, maybe this is the key thing, this is a live um, set of information. The meeting goes on, I brought in uh, the <laughs> and, I, and I have the meeting that we, uh, I noted down the wireless code for the hotel. It's like a written transcript of the event. I had a meeting with, looks like I had a meeting with uh, John Doe again, who wants to, wants to help uh, with the new Wonderlands, and uh, I think we can, we can help him with that. So. Um, also very, very useful 
for sitting through the sessions. And actually, we do this um, in some way. You must do this in some way, but maybe maybe uh, largely on paper. I encourage you to think about these sorts of systems where you can bring in live whilst the sessions are happening relevant um, information. We had a fantastic meeting, a fantastic first day at the BCI last year. It's the first session on discontinuations. You know, I like to track a lot of this information. Lyndon had some uh, good things I know I wrote down here, but you know, I was able to pull in whilst he was talking this paper that I think he mentioned by Kathy Dumbleton. You know, I was able to bring this into my into my notes as it was going live. So really everything, all of my thoughts, I was able to pull together for uh, for this meeting. And uh, also, well, here is uh, I had the honour of delivering the BCI medal last year, and that. Uh, all the preparations for the meeting, you know, ended up low down on this note, and uh, it's all, it's all. Uh, I should say that this particular program does something rather clever. It looks, it, it sort of uh, goes out and automatically looks for information about anybody who you, any topic or anything that you, um, uh, or any person that gets mentioned, it goes and pulls in their LinkedIn details. If you have a, a LinkedIn account and the attractive photos, uh, as you've seen there. So this is incredibly simple, it's an everything book, but it's incredibly powerful, it brings everything together in the one place. Another area um, this is very useful for is in collaborative working. Um, and, uh, Carol, I'm going to ask you to speak for just a few words on this if, if you don't mind. Carol and I, Carol's my colleague from the University of Manchester, we, um, we supervise graduate students, as many of us, us do. And we find using this sort of system for graduate student supervision being incredibly powerful. And uh, so I think get a drink, I'm going to ask Carol to say a few words on, on, on how this is so powerful for us. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, working with Phil, this webinar was slightly forced down my throat, and I absolutely love it. Um, I've not looked back. One of the things that perhaps might not be obvious to some of you is the fantastic thing about Evernote is that all the notes are searchable. So I don't know if ever you've been to a meeting and you recall a lecture that someone did, someone said something, and you know, a few years back I was writing things like that in notebooks and I could never find my notes. So one of the real advantages of Evernote that I find is that everything's searchable. Now what Phil's asked me to talk about, I think, is um, how we use this with our PhD students. So typically we would meet our PhD students every two weeks, sometimes once a month, and it can be quite difficult to remember what was agreed at the previous meeting with that particular PhD student. So um, what we do is we create a notebook. So um, you can create not just notes, but individual notebooks where you can deposit individual notes. And if you create a notebook for a PhD student, you can share that notebook amongst the supervision team and also the PhD student. And they can upload um, Excel worksheets about their progress, um, experiment write-ups, and Evernote actually allows you to tick things off. There's a really nice little function where you can tick things off. Here you so, go, Carol. I'll uh, do this in our shop There you go. So what I, I find that really nice because as I'm getting older, my memories going and you can remember what you've asked them to do if they've done it. So, is that okay, Phil? That's good, yeah, thanks, Carol. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> okay, so we've got, we've got this bucket now, and I've shown you some, the, some pretty simple, perhaps rather obvious way of getting stuff in the bucket, creating a <laughs> note, and bringing in, uh, adding text, or bringing in, in files. Uh, but this is a sophisticated gathering program, and it has a number of ways of, of doing it. Something that I use quite a bit because I'll be in a meeting and perhaps I'm, a, perhaps I'm hearing uh, a lecture on a uh, topic I don't really know much about. You know, contact lenses, something like that. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they're laughing online, hopefully people are killing themselves laughing. <laughs> um, but you know, you might be meeting and there's a topic you think, well, I just, 
sort of heard of some of that stuff, but I don't know if you should be. I'll, I will, you know, I'll sit there in the in the in the, in the lecture and I'll, um, you know, I'll go through Wikipedia, which I think is somewhat maligned as well. I think Wikipedia is outstanding. Um, and, uh, and and dig out the information, and I can shoot it straight from Wikipedia into my Evernote account, so that uh, a minute later it's on my phone and everywhere else. So we might be interested in, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, let's talk about light light design. Right? We want to talk about light design. Here's light design. Why not in my Evernote account? So uh, Evernote has a little facility where it puts a little uh, little. I can see that little elephant uh, icon there, and it, it allows me to. Uh, okay, so it allows me to save that article with a tag. I'm calling this W3. Okay, and so that is now that's now gone into my uh, Evernote account. What else might be interested in Wikipedia? Who wants to give me a topic? Sunderland. Sunderland. <laughs> Sunderland is a, uh, a world leading uh, football or soccer club. So here we go, we'll find the uh, Sunderland AFC page. And I'm going to shoot that over to uh, a WC3 tag. And save that into my own account. Okay, so you can, you, can, you can keep doing that. And if I go, in fact, if I go to Evernote, and I'll just uh, get it to sync here, it should appear. Hopefully, everything now appears. Okay, there's, well, there you go. So there's my, this is the live design page now, now in my now in my Evernote account. It's available to me everywhere. And you can imagine if you're building up a project, you want to write a paper on proteins, or you're trying to um, 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 do some work around the top. You can build this library of this sort of information. And there's my uh, some of the AFC one now. We never know. That's now on my phone and on my iPad as well. And you can quickly develop huge libraries of information. Uh, this system also allows you to um, uh, do sort of screenshots, take part of the page. Uh, and maybe you also now want to, you know, you want to sort of highlight something here and highlight that bit of information there, like this, or uh, put an arrow on. Okay, well, we're going to talk about this thing here and uh, save it, and that and will go into my account. So here's a fantastic way of getting information into it. Almost better than that, perhaps, is getting information from your uh, email program. Okay, we got an email this week on um, uh, from the American Academy. This is a good way of organizing your email. Use Evernote to uh, organize your email. This email from the American Academy uh, came in. I'm going to forward that email. I'm going to forward this email to my Evernote, <coughs> Evernote account. Uh, press send. Uh, no, no, I need, I need to put the sorry, I need to put the tag. Press Evernote to go. I'm just going to put the tag at the end. WC3, so it files it correctly. WC3, and that should now Evernote account. So there's numerous ways of getting all of your stuff into this uh, one, one, uh, one particular bucket. And when that sinks, hopefully that will work. Okay, last chance. So here's that email from the American Academy, all now in my Evernote bucket. A really good way of organizing uh, your email. I'm very interested in how we all organize our email. Maybe if I get a chance towards the end, what we'll talk about. Perhaps uh, for now, I just want to talk about another way that I've really uh, transformed how I operate, and that is to try and move away from making notes on paper and try and make notes on uh, my iPad. So let's talk about penultimate. Oops.
Now, I'm sure a lot of you have looked at different ways of taking notes on your tablet devices. And um, it seems that there are a lot of apps available for this. I was excited to use this one because it automatically takes all of my information directly into my uh, Evernote account. Yeah, doesn't seem all the work for now. I might have to return this uh, later on. It seems to be fun. Maybe. Um, I'll try and open the video. making sort of daily notes. You know, notes taken on your phone, on a phone conference, talking with a student, uh, preparing a lecture. I wanted to move away from doing this on paper and trying to move to an electronic system. The benefit of that, as I would see it, and I think it's something Carol alluded to, is it's searchable. You know, I'd like many of you, I've got, uh, you know, elegant notebooks going back 20 years of notes that I still sit in my office, and I can vaguely remember having a conversation with uh, Gary Osborne, or Brian Ackerman, or Ian Davies, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I can remember we talked about something, and almost, it's almost impossible to go back and find that information. The main benefit I would see about an electronic system of taking your notes is that it's searchable. You can go back, you can find the information that you took 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I like this particular program because it syncs in automatic with my Evernote account, so everything is in my everything. Okay. There are a range of these uh, available. Um, um, I personally find that um, when I'm on the telephone, that I'm not able to type notes on my computer fast enough and in a way that is efficient to get the information there. It's almost like it's too, it's too hard for my brain to be talking on the phone and also typing the information. You might be better at that than I am, but I resort to uh, electric notes, electronic notes, um, and do so. So um, uh, I'm sure that many of you will have seen this, uh, these sorts of approaches. Let's, uh, let's open up a new note here. Yeah. So here we go. So um, I'm just going to we'll get we'll make a few notes and then we'll we'll, we'll, we'll see it in in notes. So. Excuse my uh, writing, but um, is it the 25th today? So, uh, meetings, uh, and what we find is that with these systems, the optical character recognition is so good that even my not ideal handwriting becomes searchable. So that I, I will be able to find WC3 in my notes um, um, uh, tomorrow and thereafter. Actually, thank you, Gina, for that question. This is a separate app uh, if, you, if you're using it on um, your tablet device. Thank you for that question. Uh, 
so, uh, oops. So we are having a great meeting. So I've, I've got this. Uh, I've got this uh, notebook called WC Drill. This note that is all of the information I've got in this particular part of my room. And so, um, again, think about how this. Think about how you can use this. That all of your information that you're recording becomes this permanent, potentially massive archive of notes that you've made in your office, probably. For potentially many years. I, so I have a, a notebook um, with more of my handwritten notes um, for about the past two years. And I can go and search that, which I think is incredibly powerful. And it's available to me all the time. It's available to me on my phone on the train that I go into work. So, for example, here's a note that I did uh, the other day. And I can bring it you know, I might be sitting, uh, you know, at the, I had a chat with Shazad about something. And I can, I'm searching for Nauru here, and hopefully you can see that it's already found uh, Nauru. Uh, I can be, I think, I think it probably will recognise Alcon now and search for even that sort of almost draw note it, 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 it finds. So the object of character the recognition engines on which these programs are now based um, is extremely powerful, and even retrospectively. Um, look back at your handwritten notes uh, over many years, and uh, uh, and find what you find what you've written, the notes that you've made. Very powerful. Okay, Gina, question. Um, well, let's say you have files of notes already. Can you scan those in, let's say, as a PDF and attach it to this? And would it be able to search those PDFs or not? So the, the question is, if you've got some handwritten notes yeah. and you want to get into this sort of system, yeah. you have to absolutely do that. Um, should, we, should we have a go at that? If you've got a PDF up there already. Uh, I've got some, uh, I've got a scanner, and I've got some notes. Oh, okay. That's great. Okay. So, um, I was going to talk about scanning a little bit later, but one, uh, the other thing that's transformed my working life, and Gina's just given us a segue into this, is, is this thing. This is a scan, snap, scan. That's it. And it's a beautiful device because I remember scanners, when, you know, with the, like, you know, like, like the photocopy with the big lid and the glass plate, and it's super tedious. Super tedious. Now, this, these modern scanners, because they were their sheets, uh, sheet feeding scanners, just take all of the tedium uh, away from them. This particular device actually also uh, needs no uh, needs no separate power. It's powered through the USB cable. If I'm at a conference, a big meeting, and I'm going to the American Telecom Tommy, I'm going to wait for a few days, I actually will take this with me in my bag, in my briefcase, because so much paper comes out of the meetings. You know, the, the leaflets that come under the door in a hotel room or something to pick up a handout, uh, I'll take it and I'll just take it back to my room and, and, and scan it in. So we can have a go at this. So, the beauty of these modern scanners is they come with a range of preloaded scripts or, or, or programs that, before you do the scan, you de determine what you want to what you want to do with it. And so there's a big long list there, including uh, uh, ones that are probably pretty obvious: so scan of email, scan to a folder, of to save it. But you can uh, you can write modify how these things operate. So I've got on here scan. Papers, which is my papers application that and looks after all the academic papers that I have, or anything else. So we can uh, we can scan to have notes. Okay. So we might have uh, okay. I, I don't actually have any handwritten notes. I, think I could put handwritten notes. You probably don't want them on the screen. So, uh, but yeah, this could, this is something you might just uh, resource, and I'm just going to put it. Can't see this in the back. But uh, I put it in the front of the scan. Press the button. Okay. 
and uh, and that's it. It's now just being processed by the scanner. Look, how much are those? Let me show you. Uh, these are about 100 pounds. That's it. Start, start with it again. And if you buy a good one? <laughs> <laughs> I've just ripped this out of uh, I've just ripped this out of a magazine and it's uh, the uh, there's some sort of let me try another page. Let me try uh, let me try and get that one. Let me try this one. This was never gonna be a totally smooth uh, session. It's a crap yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're going to finish scanning, and uh, so it just takes a few seconds to process. It's doing all the optical optical character recognition, which uh, means that this now becomes a searchable uh, uh, searchable note. Uh, so that is now in my Evernote folder. Okay, I have to go through and label it in order to for us to see it straight away. So I'll do that later on and offline. A bit conscious this is my genuine uh, uh, um, notebook, so I uh, um, can't quite go into uh, all of the details of my notebook. So I'll show you that in a moment. And this is, I will say that I find this these sorts of scans particularly useful for processing um, uh, papers that appear in journals which are not easy to get electronically. Uh, I do this notably with uh, articles in, in Optician magazine. So you will have, I think, your own equivalents in, in your own country. So we, we might have a, uh, I've got a little script here that will, uh, <coughs> oops, I'm pressing the wrong thing, scan to papers. So I, I will have a paper in, uh, in uh, we've got something in, in Optician, then, uh, Then this should be processed automatically and put in my personal library of, of, of references. Uh, hopefully here. Okay. So uh, that's all my papers. Does that one appear somewhere? Okay. So that, in fact, it does this very, very smartly because it. it it guesses at the title of the paper. I think it looks at the biggest text, and already in the database top right, it's worked out that the term "the road best travel" that you can see uh, there is probably the title of the paper. Now, in this case, you have to do a bit of manual input, put in the authors and that sort of thing. Uh, but these sorts of scanners are great for getting, again, becoming paperless, getting rid of your paper in your office. So you can use these sorts of devices to get. Get rid of all your paper and get into the everything book in approach. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about Google Drive. Thirty six percent of us have a Google Drive account. I think this is an astonishing free resource. I should say Evernote, by the way. Everything I've talked to so far is free. I personally pay for Evernote Premium because I find it so valuable and that gives you one or two extra, uh, extra resources. Um, uh, but Google Drive also is free. Um, I think this is very much a, a, a peek into our future because with Google Drive, you can uh, build you can put just for yourself spreadsheets, word processing documents or presentations, or perhaps more usefully, these can be shared collaboratively with people around the world. So for example, um, if you're at a, a WC3 show notes page, 
what you're seeing there is a Google, uh, a Google Drive <coughs> word processing document that Alison and Siobhan are editing, hopefully editing for us, uh, live as we go through this. Is it working, Alison? Siobhan, is it working? Yeah, good. Um, so, is anybody looking at that? Has anybody seen the show notes? Has anybody put it up on the screen? WC3ShowNotes.com? Is it not that? Yeah, we got it there. Is it we got it? Yeah, some people over here. Yeah. Who's, who can see WC3ShowNotes.com? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just, that's just you, Lyndon. They got us karma for slagging off my scan. There is a playground link. I just want you to I want you to click on the playground link. I want uh, you need to bring that up. I want everybody to do a little bit of editing. And uh, uh, because this is a presentation and I just thought we'll get a few people in there adding to this, just play around with this. Uh, uh, is that working for uh, if you need to edit this, if you're editing this on an iPad, and I, there's no nobody's tracking what you're doing here. You can go and edit this and do whatever you like. I want uh, uh, text, um, uh, shapes, whatever you like to do. If you're doing this on an iPad, it's just a little trick you need to do. You need to do two taps before you go to um, open in desktop mode. You need to check this is working correctly. Just first tap the address and then tap where the time is. You should see, yeah, and then tap the time. Tap the time. Okay, request desktop site if you can see that. If you're on a laptop, you have to do this, you can just click on the link. And it should bring up an editing page up there. Yeah. And uh, from this, you should be able to add. Yeah. So let me do this. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes. Just add a slide, put a shape in, add some text, whatever you like. We'll see where we get to. Give you two minutes. Linda, are you, is it working? Somebody said you. This is all very basic. Two of them. Uh, Luke is saying this is all a bit data intensive. You're on a personal database? Or but, but I think from a personal point of view, it's effectively, it's effectively infinite, isn't it? I mean, yeah. But that, presumably, there's <laughs> sure. So there, there are limits, and there, there are to get in a free account, you, there are certain data transfer limits. Save that. I don't know. I, I've never got within. I, I'm at five percent of my monthly limit, and I use it a lot. So for practical purposes, it doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be a problem. Is anything in this? Do you just can't get? That's good. So you actually, I, as I understand it, in a in a in a in a shared presentation or word processing files, that you can have fifty people on at the same time. And I think what is unique in my experience about Google Drive is you can actually see it all happening live in front of you. The syncing is such it's a different, slightly different approach than the syncing engine, and it all happens live in front of you. This whole conference was organised on Google Drive because we had about six or ten of us involved with the organization, and we all shared everything in, uh, in, in Google Drive. It's a remarkable free resource. So let's just see where we got to. My wife, there we go, so... Oh. Okay, so hopefully uh, you can see that you can collaboratively work on, on, on these sorts of things. It's happening live in front of us. And uh, it is an extremely useful way of working and it's all it's, it's all free. Uh, just as a as a case example of how I would use this, I found this extremely useful when leading uh, 
a group of colleagues when um, reviewing our curriculum, I chose rather than take minutes of, of, a, of a series of meetings, there was only about six or eight of these meetings, I actually recorded everything in a Google presentation like this about what was said, who did what, what the action points were, and that became then a shared result so everybody could see what we discussed and what we agreed to do. So it has, I think, an incredible utility. Google Drive. Phil? Yes. Just to let you know that the the web page that we're linking to the live broadcast is on Google Drive, but you've published the file and everyone can see it. And if you change it at any point, it will update automatically. So it's a bit like having your own web presence that you can publish that. Thank you, Ian. Okay. Let's talk about Dropbox. Let's talk about Dropbox. 57% of us have a Dropbox account. Who loves Dropbox? Oh, I think the best, the best thing ever. What are you using Dropbox for? <laughs> Everything? What about sharing files? You should share files with colleagues. Okay. I think many people will know this, but if you've not, then again, if, if this is some of this, if this is new to you, what I'm about to show you is going to transfer, transform your life. Because we all face that thing where once we get the 10, 20 megabytes of a file attachment, we want to email it. Email servers around the world uh, start, start, start rejecting. So you can easily share a file on your own hard drive. I'm going to show you how to do that with a bit of an extra twist that you might be in, uh, interested in. If this is something you do routinely. Okay. Here's my WC3 Dropbox folder. I should say that if I'm ever traveling, I, I will, uh, for that trip, I will do everything that relates to that trip in the Dropbox folder. I'm always paranoid about losing data when I'm on the road, having had a couple of occasions where hard disk break ends the day before a presentation, or indeed during a presentation once, um, can be particularly problematic. So Dropbox is a good way of getting your own information up into the cloud so it's available to you at all times. Uh, so I might want to share this, uh, I might want to share the program, here's a PDF, so look there, there's a PDF of uh, the program for this event. Dropbox has a, um, a keystroke on a map, it's controlled and clicked, and you get a range of different functionality, and one of which is to share the Dropbox link. That name puts the link of that file, that file is sitting on my hard drive, but it's been shared to the cloud. And now on my clipboard on my computer is the, the web link, the URL to access that. So you can share that uh, by email. It's, uh, that's we could write a new, uh, a new email and, and link. And I'll just put in there, there's the link there. So I can share that with uh, share that with Craig. Here's the link. And send that off. Nice little touch there, a little something a bit fancy if you want to do that differently is you can use a, um, a web link, abbreviated web, website again, this is all free, something like a tiny, tiny URL to take those long complex email addresses that you will never be able to remember and make it short and simple. So for example, I'm going to put in here and I'm pasting, that's the long horrible Dropbox uh, address. But I can put a custom um, short code here. Let's call that WC3 uh, program. And uh, that creates that, creates that uh, address. So now we've got a shortened version of that long Dropbox link. So I can even type, I can even type that out. I can paste it, but I'll. Uh, I'll type that WC3 program. And hopefully, if I hit return, it should bring up, uh, it should look like my Dropbox folder and uh, should bring it up for me, I hope. <coughs> okay, so using Dropbox to get that information 
uh, around the world. Okay, who's this? It's Jennifer Lawrence, Hollywood actress. She's had a difficult time over the last 12 months because? Leaked photos. She's going to have Chris Martin, is she? <laughs> Leaked photos, says Dwight. We can talk about security. Uh, James, have you ever had your email account hacked? No. No? Uh, Mate, have you ever had your email account hacked? No. The thing is, you wouldn't necessarily know if you had it. That's the problem. That, that is the big problem with this sort of thing. Once everything's in the cloud, it's all very well for me thinking, well, I can get to this with my phone and my iPad and my laptop. But the reality is, potentially, there are, I don't know how many billion web-enabled devices um, out there. But anybody sitting any one of those devices could potentially get my stuff. Because if you think about it, a lot of you, the information you have is quite widely known. If you have a Dropbox account, you've probably got important stuff in your Dropbox account. You should really think carefully about what you put in Dropbox. Plus, even if it's just a presentation for a conference or some notes for a meeting, that's, that's important. You don't want other people to get hold of that. And Dropbox is simply your email address with a password. I know the email address of everybody in this room. So all I'm going to do is start playing around and working out what your password might be. Because you've all, 57% of you've got a Dropbox account. I could probably work out if I wanted to, you know, I could probably find out what your kids' names might be, maybe what your date of birth is, start to play around with those sorts of combinations. The problem Jennifer Lawrence had is that some websites, including iCloud Photos, <coughs> allow somebody like me or some bad guy to um, put in an unlimited number of password guesses. There are many services, of course, that once you get three or five or seven attempts, kind of times out and it stops. But some are not like that. So what happened with Jennifer Lawrence and all of the other um, actors and actresses at this time was they had their photos stored in iCloud. So all you need to do is kind of work out what their email address is. I don't know what Jennifer Lawrence's email address is. She never, she never wrote back. <laughs> um, but I could probably work that out. That's probably somewhat available. And then it's just in the case of trying to brute force attack the password box on the iCloud website. And that's how this person got into her iCloud account. Well, her iCloud account is all of her email, all of the photos, and a whole lot of other stuff. And you can do this from anywhere in the world unless you protect yourself. And I want to um, just talk to you about how you might protect yourself with 2FA. Who knows what 2FA is? Two-factor authentication. I'm going to show you why this is really important and something we should all consider here. In essence, two-factor authentication brings in a whole extra layer of security that's really very straightforward for us to operate. Essentially, if you try and get into this account, your Dropbox account, for example, from a, a different computer, one that you've not been at before, then it will send a text message to a nominated device to make sure that it's really you. Now, if, it's, if you're working on something that you've already um, got into Dropbox, or any of these other systems, before, it's not just Dropbox, Evernote, Google Drive, um, iCloud, lots of them, if you turn it on, then if, if you're on a device that you've used before, it, it doesn't go through this process. It knows that this is your device, recognizes the device, and it lets you in. But if I want to use it, if I use go down the corridor and use that, that computer that I think is in, in the reception area there and try and get my Dropbox account, it will only, only let me do so if having sent a text message to my phone and then I can look at the pin code that it sends. That really is an extremely powerful bit of security because it means that there are, rather than being 10 billion ways of getting into my Dropbox account, it's then the three that I've already authorized or that I, I, uh, I will additionally add by sending me a text message. Uh, should we see if we can get this to work? 
because you only turn this on if uh, you have some stuff in the client, I think. Right. So Ian has kindly um, kindly lent me his iPad, which I've not used before. Uh, we need to turn this on. Okay, so I'm going to try and get my Dropbox account through Ian's iPad, which I've not used before, and I hope that um, the problem with this is you can't really test, you can't reverse this bit because you have to be using a device for the first time for this to take effect. But I'm going to put in my uh, my uh, one of my Dropbox accounts addresses. So. <laughs> You'll have to change your code now. Okay, we've set the code to your phone number ending that because I've already, you know, this has been teed up ahead of time. And I've just received a text message 207270. 207270 is the code that it's just sent me. Uh, I've uh, clicked the wrong thing. Hold on. Oh, okay. Two o uh, seven. Two seven o. Uh, Submit. Just this And you should see some stuff, some folders in my Dropbox account. Okay, so um, using a new computer for the first time means that you're safe, you're secure, because unless somebody has you held for stitch and also has your mobile phone, then that's. Um, uh, very unlikely that any people break into that carrot. Can you just tell us how you switch that on? So how do you go about doing it? So each of these resources, like Dropbox or Evernote, has its own way of switching it on, but they've, they've got their own sort of settings page. And uh, you go for that, and you, you, you tick a, a box there, and it should work. Okay, that seems to have gone black on I me. Mean. Okay, Lewis is saying, you mean like say through Dropbox? So there's a, there is a particular issue with executable files, as Lewis uh, alluded, because if somebody receives an executable file doesn't know what they're doing and opens it, then it's an executable. So it will do stuff that would be it could be bad. So um, various systems I think try and prevent that. I actually don't know. My, I'm pretty sure that I've sent applications, zip them up and send them through Dropbox. I think that's I think that's okay. I guess it's not something I've done before sometime. So I'm not sure. Okay. Finally, 
on the, I'm going to finish off uh, talking about security by talking about passwords. Yes. Uh, so Google in particular is very strong on that. If you if you're overseas, in my experience, and try to your Google account, it can start to do, you know, that's another preventive mechanism that it has, and you have to sort of go in and be authenticated and everything. So that's trying to protect you from this fact that 10 billion people can get into your Dropbox account um, or Google Drive account. So Google I think, has that layer of security. Actually, it's a bit tedious, actually, but, it, but it, it's there for, for that purpose. Some of these systems are a bit wider. Not anything like as good as two factor authentication, though. Um, okay, I'm going to finish off with. I'm going to finish off on the security theme by just encouraging everybody to get wise with your passwords. Because as we move into the cloud and it has the great utility of being available to us everywhere, as I've said, it's available to everybody potentially everywhere. And Jennifer Lawrence, who's easy to find her, um, it's easy to find her email address, and she, I don't know, she probably had a pretty simple password. She probably put her kid's name plus their date of birth or something like that. There'll be some people in this room whose passwords are their children's name, uh, you know, to the month of their birth or, or something like that. Okay? I think I'm right. You know, it's not that hard to work out. So, um, I'm going to encourage everybody to think about using a password manager. A password manager that um, does all of your passwording for you, if you like. I use something called One Password, actually, to pay for application. There are others available which I've not used, they could well be better, but I just want to talk about the concept of managing your passwords. These password manager uh, resources allow you, if you can remember one very long complex password, then it will manage all of your individual, assign individual complex passwords for any resource that you're using, and you never need to remember what they are, because you just have to remember the one master password. And it works something like this. I don't, I don't have an account. I don't have an account with Yahoo, so I was going to subscribe today to uh, Yahoo. Or I'm not, I, I need to sign out and sign in. That's right. Okay, so you're going to sign up to a new web account. You do this all the time. You probably do this once or twice a week. You're signing up some new process, a new system, and you've got to put a password in, right? Super tedious because you always use that one as your kid's name, plus the date of their, their date of birth or something like that. So a password manager does all this for you. So let's just put it in, put in some details here. Uh, okay, I'm putting one of the right. Okay, then you get. I need it. Uh, okay, more than for the fifteen. Okay, then you get the password box. Really deep. You stumped because you, you, you want to do this fast, and you go back to the, the old favorites. Uh, one password. Another password managers just allow you within the web browser to get to your uh, uh, get to uh, get to do this, and it has a password generating facility. Okay. My password generator, this is what it's suggesting here. Of course, this can go as long as you like. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna fill that one. Okay. Uh do I need to oh okay, I'll put in uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, no, put in just some fake details here. <laughs> uh, create account, and it's going to save these details. Okay. 
Okay, this phone number associated, my fake phone number is associated with too many accounts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not too many digits. Um, okay, now we've got the password in again. Let's generate the password up there. Password generator, that one there, fill it in. You can show the password, that's what it is. <laughs> Fred came. Okay, that's all done. It's going to send some details now and all the rest of it. But, but that's how you get it. So I'll, I'll never know what that password is. I do know that my master password is going to be in the database. So that has to be big and complicated. But beyond that, I never know what these passwords are. When I next go to re log into that service, because I know my master password, it will fill in all those details for me. It's highly secure and something in Jennifer Lawrence that I really should have done. Well, how did you do that here? How did it all work? Uh, I've got a little, I've got a trunk of one password, it's a password manager. Does that make sense? And it has this little, uh, little toolbar utility. Of that, okay? I'll tell you what else that this program does. It, 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 once you're in, it's got your credit card details as well. And so when you get that, those tedious pages where put in, put in your credit card details, it's a one click option and everything fills in, uh, date of the expiry. The little CVV code or whatever it's called. Okay, I'm pretty much from the time. Now, uh, so that, that was a, a selection from a number of things that I try and do to make my work as efficient as, as possible. Hopefully, hopefully there's some uh, information there that will be useful to your own workflows. And you need to think about security pretty seriously as well because everybody's getting into this. Um, we're going to move to a coffee break. Uh, in the lounge area. We can leave our stuff here. There'll be somebody in the room at all times, so you can leave your stuff. Uh, uh, but I hope that was interesting to you. Thank you very much for listening to me.